Hi, uh, I'm Leonard Puttering, and I uh, work on Systemd, as you might know. Um, I'm speaking today about something called the bootloader spec, which uh, is actually like the specification for this we actually came up with a long time ago. But I kind of want to uh, <clears throat> like spend more time again to make this more uh, popular and established in the in the community because it's actually awesome concepts. Uh, this is actually the same talk I did at All Systems Go last year, so if you have been there, there's nothing new for you in this. Uh, for everybody else, I hope this is going to be interesting. Um, so yeah, the bootloader spec. What is this? Um, yeah, long story short, if you go to that URL, you can actually read the specification. Um, what is SD boot? The other half of this talk. Um, it's yeah. If you want to know the details, go to that. Uh, URL, and I guess I can go now, right? Like, now you know everything. Um, SD boot is something that was, uh, used to be called gummy boot um, in, a, in an earlier life, and then we uh, moved it into, under the systemd umbrella, and now it's called uh, systemd boot or short SD boot. So let's go a little bit into detail what the bootloader spec is. It's a general spe specification for any platform, any firmware, for uh, bootloader entries. Um, the boot entries are drop-in files, right? This takes uh, inspiration from how we generally do things in RPM-based and Debian-based systems, where we nowadays like, have, for example, desktop files which are dropped into one directory, and simply the act of dropping it there registers the, the application with GNOME and KDE and whatnot, right? And we do this all over the place in RPM, right? Like we always have, like, for example, if you want to extend the stuff that, I don't know, started, like, is run when you log into your bash, we have these directories in Etsy, profile D or something like this, where you can just drop stuff and get run when you log in, right? So this mechanism of having drop-in files um, is something we have been using on, on RPM-based systems, on, on Linux for a long time. It's something we have been using on systemd for, for since day one, like, for example, if you know tempfiles.d, uh, it's exactly the same thing. You have one directory, you drop it in there, the instant it's dropped in, it's kind of registered with the system and everybody reads it, right? So the idea of the bootloader spec is, let's take this very basic idea and just use it for bootloaders so that every bootloader entry that you see in the bootloader menu is just one of these drop-in files. These drop-in files are located below, below something I generally just abbreviate dollar boot here. Looks like an envir var environment variable, but it's supposed to be just a placeholder that uh, dictates where to find these drop-in entries. They're actually, what dollar boot actually means, there are two options. There's option A, um, where dollar boot is a partition, um, and if you use MBR partition table, like the good old classic DOS partition table that are still popular in the cloud, then uh, you use that uh, partition type there, which is EA in hex. Or on GPT, you use this uh, long uh, type UAD. That is where these entries are supposed to be found. Option number B, the dollar boot actually equals the EFI system partition. This is actually on UFI system that's much nicer because you don't even need anything um, like additional. The only reason why option A exists is basically because, uh, yeah, not all systems are UFI yet. And uh, people are a little bit allergic about um, growing or shrinking or changing the, the ESP. Hence, it's a little, sometimes a little bit nasty to actually drop additional files in there simply because there's no space. So that kind of makes sense to use a separate partition. But the data we put in there has kind of the similar life cycles as the bootloader itself that we put in there. Like it's seldom updated, but it is updated, and the update is relatively simple. Um, there are no like uh, particular attributes, file system features, anything required. So yeah, this can be two separate uh, partitions. It can be the one partition on classic MBR, and it can be the other one, the SPO on, on modern system. It can be both in parallel, but yeah. Uh, because this, these options exist, we just ref refer um, to either of them, yeah, depending on what actually applies to your system, as dollar boot. The file system of these file systems is supposed to be VFAT, like UFI mandates that kind of for uh, UFI, for the ESP, but we also say, yeah, for the, for the, uh, uh, the other boot partition, the one of option A, we say, yeah, it probably should be VFAT too. It's not enforced by specification, it's just a suggestion. The reason why it's a suggestion is, is because it's actually the file, like the, 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 the file system format that really everybody understands. All the, the um, operating systems understand it. And the firmwares do too, like uh, UFI generally does at least, and uh, there are a couple of other firmware types that also support this. So it's kind of, it's not a good file system. Nobody thinks that it is. 
but uh, the, the basic functionality it supports is absolutely enough to manage a couple of dropout files. So, um, system E actually knows that this is how dollar boot is defined and actually helps you with things. So in case of option A, after you booted the system, um, yeah, this file system, if it is found, it will automatically uh, mount to slash boot. Only if the user has an FS type entry that mounts something else to slash boot though, right? Like, so we, we don't try to fuck with uh, your FS type configuration, it always takes precedence. But if you have no such configuration, and we do find this partition on disk, um, because it's in the partition table, we just use it mounted for you. We mount it for you actually in a really nice way because it's like auto mounts and stuff like that. So um, it takes um, credit. Like, like we accept the fact that VFAT is not the best file system in the world. So it's actually set up so that when you actually access slash boot, we mount it. Then you can make your changes. And a couple of seconds after you stopped accessing, it gets unmounted. So it gives you this wonderful guarantee that uh, in almost doing the entire runtime of the system, this directory is actually unmounted, right? Again, if you do the, have something that's f, f, f step, all of that doesn't apply. You don't get this nice, beautiful auto discovery. You just, uh, yeah, you get the classic stuff and VFAT is fucking broken. Um, in case of option B, um, uh, uh, system currently does the same thing, but mounts it to slash EFI because then it's the ESP and that's where it should be. Um, yeah, so this just, just, like, this has nothing to do with the bootloader spec. It just, is an indication, like, if you adopt the bootloader spec, how you get these wonderful things where um, the, these VFAT partitions are managed as nicely as we can. Oh, by the way, also, when you first access um, these directories, we do an implicit FS check in the background, so you can actually, yeah, you have this lazy behavior where there's the best guarantee that when you access, either got fixed up, and then when you stop using it, it's, it's definitely in a clean state because it's unmounted. Okay, let's go back to the actual bootloader spec stuff. Um, now we know where to look for these drop-ins. So now let's look at the kind of drop-ins we're actually interested in. There's type one. Type one is basically inside of the partition that I call dollar boot, where we have this VFAT file system or not, for some other file system. We have a directory called loader, and under that a directory called entries, and then we have um, all kinds of conf files, right? Every conf file just synthesizes one boot menu entry. These conf files are simple text files. They are intended to be extremely simple. There is no, no uh, pattern replacement. There is no, I don't know, multi-line stancers. There's nothing, right? These are files that are supposed to be generated by user space and read by user space, but primarily are supposed to be read by bootloaders. Bootloaders should not have programming languages built in, is my firm belief. They should be simple, right? So these drop-ins are dead simple. They describe the kernel. They describe an internet ID. They describe a name, a version, a couple of other metadata. This metadata is kind of enough to boot the thing, but also kind of uh, is useful for actually ordering it on screen, right? So that the newest version is always on top and things like that. There's a second type. The second type is uh, something that I think is actually even more interesting, but is less flexible. Then the second type is in the same partition, dollar boot, and there are subdirectory EFI Linux, we have binaries called something EFI. These binaries are EFI executables. You know, uh, I'm not sure how well you know EFI, but basically the EFI firmware it has a concept of, uh, basically you have like Windows EXA binaries or Linux ELF binaries. You can um, just program your code and then you can put it there and you can execute it if you want. So type two stuff, uh, type two um, drop-ins are just binary files. And there's nothing else done. There is no further metadata stored outside. These binaries are unified EFI kernels, right? Like, so they combine um, a kernel, an inner ID, some metadata, and possibly other things into one binary. Um, this is beautiful, I think. This is beautiful for a couple of things, and we'll see later why. But uh, yeah, so the gist to take away is type one, descriptive configuration file. Type two, one binary, and that's all per, per menu item. Um, so let's go back to type one. Type one is generic, flexible. You can use a text editor because it's a very simple text file. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very powerful thing, but um, it also means that because it is a text file, it will change from every system to every system because every admin can edit them and make changes. Type two is much simpler because you only drop in one file instead of um, having just a description file along with the kernel with energy and stuff like this. So um, it's very simple. That makes it very robust because the only change we actually need to do to the VFAT file system if we install something is drop in one file and hopefully that's, we're good enough to doing that relatively safely. 
It also means we can sign these entries as one thing, right? Like we can, because um, we live in a world nowadays where we have a root in these things, and in the secure root world, you basically have these EFI binaries that you sign with some key, and this key is like uh, the, the public key for it is known by, by uh, a new firmware and things like that. So if you have everything in one single file, in one single PE file even, you can sign it as one. And that basically means that everything inside of it is signed at once. So it's a kernel that is signed. It's the that is signed, which is something we, by the way, currently never do. Um, yeah, it's on the other hand specific to UFI to some form, right? Like because it assumes that you have something like an executable. Um, and yeah, I already mentioned that it's one file updates, right? Like because if you install a new kernel, you get one file dropped in. If you remove a kernel, you get one file removed. It's that easy, there's nothing else. To give you an example how this actually looks, this is an example for type one. Um, I hope the font's not too small, but as you can see, it's extremely simple. It's just one word, some white space, some value. One word, some white space, some value, and so on. So in this case, does the point actually work? Um, so in this case, you have the title, and it's Fedora 30. You have a version. This version is, is supposed to be used for sorting the entries in the boot menu, so that if you never uh, uh, did anything specific to it, it, just the new stuff can be ordered first. The machine ID is basically, you know, it's, it's the same thing as Etsy machine ID. It just tells the bootloader that these things belong together for one installation of the OS. It's primarily interesting if you install multiple operating systems on the same hard disk, if, if that's what you want to do. Like, for example, you install, I don't know, Ubuntu and Fedora on the same thing, and it should do something useful. Options, you guessed it, is a kernel command line. Linux is the kernel. Uh, InnerDRD is the InnerDRD combined. That simple. A parser. You can write for this in any programming language you like, probably in five minutes. And there's nothing fancier to it, right? There are no line breaks that allow you multi-line fields. There's no pattern uh, replacement, nothing. Dead, simple, simple enough for any bootloader to implement. Key takeaway here is both types can be used together, right? Like, so if you have one, if you actually have Fedora and that does the snippet thing because the one's powerful and, and, and things like that, and then you have Ubuntu or some weird other thing and they use the unified one, totally fine combine them together, um, bootloaders are supposed to look for both. On platforms that supposed to, uh, like support each, right? Like the, again, the config thing, like the, the config drop-ins works kind of for every, like conceptually works for every kind of firmware, every kind of architecture. The, the uh, VE file drop-ins only works, of course, for UFI. Um, another key takeaway is really these bootloader entries, right? Like these directories are supposed to be standardized. So you can share them between OSs. Right? Like we always had this problem with um, how the way, the way how we install Grub, that uh, if you install one distribution, so the other distributions, they start fighting for who owns the, 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 the bootloader, basically, who gets to be the one that is started when the system boots up, and then had all these magic code in there that tried to find the other operating system, and particularly Windows, um, and then generate bootloader entries for that, and then so that you can still boot that. But then, if you update Windows and it overrides the bootloader again, you just everything explodes, right? So this is supposed to resolve this issue, right? Like because there is nothing in the specification where it's not clear who owns it, right? Like because everybody can create the, the directory. There are no options in, in creating a directory, but the files in them they have specific owners, right? Like that every file is supposed to be owned by one um, operating system installation. And uh, if I'm Fedora and I see the Ubuntu entry there, um, yeah, I'm not supposed to ever touch that, right? Like, I'm not going to remove that. I'm not, not a change or anything like that. So there's clear ownership of each file. It's exactly how we do it for IPM, right? Like, if I, if I want to remove the uh, bin ls binary from my system, I know it's owned by the core utils IPM, and that's the only owner, and I don't get to change it because it's owned by core utils. So it defines clear ownership, and that allows us that you actually can share these drop-in directories between OSs for the first time safely. Of course, you still need one bootloader because the firmware was just going to load what, right? But so the concept is you have one bootloader, but then you have many cooperating players. They don't fuck with each other. They don't override each other. And ultimately, it doesn't matter really which bootloader leads, reads this stuff as long as there's one who does. Um, Bootloader specification, something that any bootloader can implement. I implemented myself a Grub a couple of years ago, never got merged because Grub is in this weird maintenance state back then, I think probably still now. Um, but uh, I know that a couple of other bootloaders implement this. We have one in particular um, that we support actively, it's called SDBoot. It's not used by Fedora. I think Fedora should use it, but it's a different question. 
in this talk, I don't actually want to uh, um, push people so much to use SD boot. I mean, you should, of course, but um, the key takeaway is really like, I want to push people to acknowledge that we should really go to something like the bootloader specification, which defines clear interface so that every peer, whoever has to do something with bootloader entries, actually can cooperate in the same way and it reads the same stuff. Um, yeah. Most importantly, from my system perspective, these are the two things that implant this for us. Like our bootloader SD boot, which is a UFI bootloader, awesome thing. Talk, the second part of the talks about that. But also, um, if you do systemd, use KXAC reboot. You know, in systemd, you can do system control reboot, and it reboots a machine. But there's also a system control KXAC and reboots a machine with KXAC so that the kernel is automatically loaded and you never go to the firmware, right? For this stuff, of course, we need to figure out where the fuck's the kernel, where's the init RD, how do we find that to load it, right? The way we implemented this is just like, yeah, we're another user of the bootloader spec. We look at these directories and then we see it there and we can parse these files because they're trivial to parse. And then we know uh, what to tell the KX, uh, a KXX system call to actually load into the, into the uh, uh, like what to reboot into. So, yeah, so in, in a way, system itself is actually bootloader because you can boot up a system system and then you can use system control act KX act to uh, use all the same um, bootloader, uh, bootloader entries to start something else. So much about the bootloader spec. I hope, th hope you got what this is about. You know, just to compare this, how we traditionally do this with Grub, right? Like we have in Grub, we have a couple of scripts that generate scripts, that generate scripts that eventually drop out a, a Grub configuration file, right? So it's all about... Yeah, and then everything has to be owned by this one operating system that installed the bootloader, and they fight for each other, and you never know what, uh, how this actually ends up, and the, the, the discovery of all the bootloader entries always happens on the operating system and never um, in the actual bootloader, so it's extremely fragile, messy, and uh, like from a computer science perspective, having shell scripts on, on grub scripts and uh, stacking all these together is just, I don't know. I'm not going to use the adjective for this. You figured out what I mean by this. Anyway, any questions so far about this part? Uh, by the way, I really like if uh, people interrupt me and ask questions um, instead of us doing, doing that all in the end. I have a question about the versioning thing you mentioned earlier. It was about uh, sorting the uh, preference in the menu. Uh, so this version we see has basically the, the RPM package version, I guess. Yep. Uh, so that's specific to the Fedora Red Hat. Uh, well, and if you're a different distro, it will have a different version of the field. But then the, your virtual learner needs to know, know about the sorting algorithms so, for the different packages. So I, I'm thinking I'm supposed to repeat the question. The uh, question was regarding the version field. Like, uh, if you look at that, you actually see the, the RPM field filled in there directly from the kernel package. Um, and uh, different distributions use uh, slightly different versioning schemes for the packages, um, how you're supposed to compare them. Uh, so uh, I think we actually used the Debian one here, and I don't know the details. You're like, good question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like, yeah, you can probably mangle it anyway, right? Like, this is, yeah. but yeah, it's a valid question. Likewise for the EFI, is this, is this in the metadata? Or you the for the what? Likewise for sorting for version, is it in the metadata for the EFI? Or how do you sort if you have multiple EFI? So, um, so the question was regarding the, the metadata for the EFI. So um, if when I talked to you about the EFI, I said kernel and the metadata all linked into one PE binary. So yeah, this is your answer. The metadata contains that stuff. So the, the, when we create unified kernels, we take the kernel image itself. We put a stub in front of it if we want. We can put the inner ID. Then we can put the metadata. The metadata is actually the way I think it, what people should do is it just add the OS release, right? And in add the OS release, um, you have the, meta the, the information about the operating system, and that includes uh, the OS version, and we parse that um, in the bootloader, and there you go, right? So we built on the, on the uh, specification that is at the OS release, basically, because it contains this information for us. Um, it actually can contain a boot splash and all these kinds as well, but yeah, different story. So, um, very good question. The question was regarding changing uh, uh, um, during boot uh, the kernel command lines. 
and how that would look like with uh, if you use a specification like this. Very good question. Like, uh, I, like later in the SD boot example, I can show you how that works. But it's basically, I mean, this is the menu that, like, the data that you should populate the menu with, right? Like, in most bootloaders nowadays have a have an editor for, for for kernel command line stuff, right? So you use this as a default, then press E or whatever your bootloader accepts, change it and to do whatever you want, right? Like, so um, this is not supposed. You know, the, the drop-in stuff um, is supposed to be editable, so you're supposed to be able to edit. In, in, if you use Secuboot and use unified kernels, this all becomes more complex if you actually sign them, right? Like, because they need to be careful what the user during boot is allowed to do with the kernel command line, right? Like, because you cannot allow it to, I don't know, uh, do privileged stuff this way. So uh, it's a bit different there, but in general, um, bootloaders are supposed to use this as a default, but give the user uh, the ability to edit it if they like. Is there a way to have a central place for the kernel command line options? So like console no SMC, like the device holding? So the, the question was regarding if there's a central place where the kernel command line options can be configured um, that applies then to all of these things. So um, yes, but it's independent of this stuff. So in, in, in systemd, since a longer time, we're shipping the script. It's called kernel install. And it's, some distributions use it, not all. Um, Fedora does. Um, it's a, if you install a new kernel package, that's stuff it's called. And it has a couple of callouts to a couple of things. And uh, uh, some of the callouts are like drag it to build it in already. But um, for us, it actually generates these snippets. And um, it generates these snippets reading the meta information from the kernel, blah, 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 and, and the taking the already. But then it also um, uh, uh, reads on one configuration file is called Etsy kernel uh, CMD line. And that the one is that is used by this generator. But I mean, the specification doesn't really care about this, like where this comes from, right? Like, yeah, um, this, is, this is also semi, supposed to be something that we semi standardize, but it's a different place to standardize this. And I don't know, people can totally write tools that they generate these drop-ins from some other data at some other time if they like, um, with some kernel command line coming from somewhere else, right? But the key takeaway really is that these files should be generated by the OS and then never be modified during boot anymore automatically, like by the user, always fine, but never automatically so that we don't have this, that the bootloader executes a, a Turing complete script again, right? Yep. So, so the, uh, the question was uh, regarding the relationship between the BLS in Fedora and the, and the bootloader spec like we define it. So the major difference is I would never call it BLS, right? Like I let the Fedora people call it BLS, I call it bootloader spec, right? I don't use the acronym. So if you see the BLS stuff, you see the Fedora one. So yeah, the Fedora people, uh, like it took us a long time. Um, like we implemented the original bootloader spec like, I don't know, five years ago. Eventually Fedora picked it up and then they fucked it up completely. Um, <laughs> It's like, they really didn't get this idea that these snippets are supposed to be stateless, not a programming language, drop it, right? Like this idea that we inherited from RPM, like if you install an RPM, the files that RPM installs for you, they are exactly the same version for everybody who installs that RPM, right? Like that's the idea of the RPM. This is the idea that we implemented here too, right? You drop in these files and then they stay the same and the interpreter of these files doesn't do anything with them, it just uses them as they are. Sorry? Sure. I live in this world where we actually change things for the better. Um, anyway, so the, the Fedora people, they then thought, OK, um, let's turn the bootloader into an interpreter for, for pattern matching and doing templating and all these kinds again. So I mean, this is kind of the problem, the thing that I always criticize with Grub that has a Turing complete programming language is this variable expansion and these kind of things. I think a bootloader shouldn't be doing that, right? Like, so I think the use case, why they want that, is absolutely valid, right? Like, they want to be able to change the stuff. The way they went for it, by making it something that, that the bootloader interprets and that there has to be a pattern language, variable expansion in the bootloader, that's the wrong approach, right? By all means, do it, generate them. If you need to change something from the OS, just rerun the stuff, regenerate it, all fine. But I'm pretty sure that these configuration files they should be static, unmodified, and not require everybody who implements a spec to basically to like build M4 again, if you follow what I read. So, so, uh, um, uh, so if you use grub, then they use this run. My original patch, of course, did the real one. Um, <laughs> Uh, so if you use a grub, the, the, the upstream grub thing for, for that is they use the Fedora one, but, but um, uh, 
more original patches are the real thing. Uh, there are distributions like Arc Linux um, that uh, use SD boot, so they use the real thing, right? Systemd itself uses the real thing. It doesn't use, like, it doesn't implement parent uh, expansion. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm doing this talk is kind of trying to get the point across why having these static things and having multiple components deal with this in a well-defined way by not requiring much of it, um, it's kind of, that's a message I want to get across and hopefully in some people's heads here why this is a good thing. Um, there's another question. Like, how much time do I have, actually have now for? Half hour. Hmm? Half hour. Half hour, OK. Then let's do more questions about this. Because I have still the second part where I actually talk about SD boot. So. OK, I only understood half of this. Can you repeat it loud? And the people who are getting up, just can you be quiet? Um, uh, so the question is regarding if you install two different distributions, which one is actually going to be the first one? Uh, it's up to for, for the bootloader to decide, right? Like um, in SD boot, we implemented like uh, if the user never specified that, never made one the default, uh, we just do this alphabetically because for lack of a better algorithm. So uh, sorry, Fedora, uh, Debian wins. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, I'll, I'll just jump to the other thing. So talk, let's talk about SD boot, which is one implementation. I personally think it's, it's what Fedora should be using on UFI systems. Because I mean, one of the key takes, takeaways I, I also want to kind of get into your heads here is it shouldn't really matter which bootloader we, we use on, 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 on the various um, architectures and the various firmwares. Because we do use different one anyway right now. Like we use weird shit on weird architectures. And I think that's completely fine, right? Like, because I think the people who maintain these architectures should be, have all rights to maintain their own bootloader because these things that tend to be highly specific to these things. What I kind of want to, the message get across is that don't standardize on the bootloader necessary. I mean, great if you manage to pull it off, but standardize on the bootloader spec instead, right? So that it doesn't matter how it's implemented, just um, uh, uh, agree on the data that they process. As to boot is one, UFI focused. Actually, it's not really a bootloader, it's a boot menu, because it doesn't do anything, right? Like a bootloader, in my opinion, is kind of something that loads stuff into memory and does some magic uh, low-level assembly stuff and then actually jumps into it and executes it. We actually don't do this in SDBoot. Everything SDBoot does, it executes uh, EFI binaries, right? So uh, the actual execution of that stuff is actually done by the UFI firmware together with the EFI stub that uh, all our kernels that we build in Fedora by default have. So it's EFI only hence, because it only executes EFI binaries. Um, it's shift with systemd. It enumerates type one and type two, of course. Um, it also has this wonderful feature that it automatically discovers Windows and Mac OS during boot time, right? Because the Windows installations and the Mac OS installations, they have, like, they're totally recognizable if you just look at the partition table and, and a couple of other things. Um, so um, instead of finding them ahead when we install Fedora and trying to then generate a a grub configuration file that then eventually gets out of date and everything is sad. This thing actually in every boot, it just quickly looks, hmm, is there Windows installed and offers the Windows thing automatically? Is there Mac OS installed? It just uh, offers that. Robust, simple, you never have to think about this. It also, like, if there's EFI shell um, installed or if the firmware supports boot into firmware, it just adds the menu entries for that as well because why wouldn't it? Um, Underlining again, Jones runs EFI executables. That's why I call it a boot menu, not a bootloader so much. Um, it's extremely simple to install. You just do type boot control, ins boot control install and just drops files into ESP and there you go. There's a boot control update. Boot control update is, is a, um, a tool for updating the bootloader. Everything it does, it looks at the bootloader that is installed, looks if it's actually something that um, is, is, has been installed originally by our OS, checks the version, if the OS has a newer version of the bootloader installed somewhere in user lib, just copies it over again. Just simple copy operation into the ESP. There you go. Um, has a cool a tool called uh, boot control status. It just shows you which bootloader is currently installed and, and uh, what are the, the boot menu options that are there. Very dead simple. Um, also has a couple of other features. Command line editor, the stuff that you asked for earlier. Has a really nice one that does Emacs and uh, uh, non-Emacs like uh, uh, control E, control A, and all this kind of stuff. It's really cool. Um, 
what also is pretty nice is that you can actually, um, when you interact with it, you can uh, press a couple of keys and change what's the default, and it's just in instantly applied. Right? Like it's not that if you want to change the default entry that is being booted into, that you actually have to do this from the West and write out a new configuration file that will fuck everything up and break again. But instead, uh, it just uses EFI variables, uh, which is like it's a concept that EFI introduced, to just store which one is supposed to be the default. So if you're unhappy with the alphabetic um, uh, ordering between Debian and Fedora, you just go to the Fedora entry and press D, and then that's the default one for all future boots. Um, there's the question. Um, so the question was regarding uh, boot control update. If it fiddles with the firmware like and, and changes the EFI variables, I figure um, it can do that, but it, you don't. Like there's a switch that says no EFI variables and it just doesn't do that. But um, I mean, uh, you're supposed to change the firmware, but it's, uh, that only really makes sense if you actually do that stuff on the system that you eventually want to run this stuff on. So it supports both. Um, yeah, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's also keys to change. Like, you can t press plus and minus, and they can change the, the, the boot menu timeout. And as you press this, it's instantly applied and applies for all future boots. So it's really nice. If you want to change these timeouts, you don't have to actually do that from them, like, and rebuild stuff and be risky and stuff like that. It also passes timing data to the West, super useful, right? Like so that you actually know that uh, how much time is being spent in the bootloader, um, so that you can do pretty graphs um, uh, afterwards. That you know how much time the firmware took to initialize, how much time our bootloader here took to initialize, how much the kernel, how much the inner D, and how much later boot takes, and then you have performance data. It's kind of beautiful. Um, yeah, it's a, there's also an E5 variable referencing the ESP. That's kind of nice and, and used by systemd because. And in system, we wanted this ability so that instead of having, having an at CFS tab, we can automatically discover the partitions that there are on, the, on, the, uh, on your hard disks and mount them automatically simply because they are there. Because the information in the GPT is kind of similar to, to the information in, in uh, at CFS tab. It just lists file systems, right? So we figured, let's tag these file systems and what to do with them explicitly and nicely in the, the GPT partition table. Um, but that really requires us to know where, which partition table to actually look like, uh, look at if you have multiple hard disks, right? So what uh, SDBoot does, it actually encodes the uh, partition it itself runs from an EFI variable and passes on to the operating system so that the operating system then can use this uh, data from this variable to find the hard disk um, that uh, the bootloader was booted from and then looks for the GPT partition table on that and automatically can use it to mount the root file system, the home file system, and whatever else you might have. Um, what's also very nice is uh, when the thing initializes, um, it finds all these bootloader entries, right? Like type one, type two, and it finds uh, Windows and Mac OS and EFI shell and stuff like that. So after you boot it up, you might want to know all these things, right? Like you want to know what, what, what was actually in the boot menu. Um, so it actually passes that to the operating system as well. So that all the discovery, all the automatic discovery is totally, like you can figure out a posteriori after the OS is up, what did the bootloader actually find there? Um, there's an EFI variable declaring a feature set because we kept adding a little couple of features so that, um, uh, yeah, the operating system can actually figure out what the bootloader supports and then can interface with that. Um, all this stuff that you see here is actually something that we implemented in SDBoot and that systemd consumes at various places, right? Like, for example, if you type systemd analyze, it actually uses the boot menu performance, uh, like the, 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 the timing stuff, to show you the, the breakdown, how much time was uh, in the bootloader. And a couple of other systemd tools use the other stuff as well. We want to keep this open so that other bootloaders can do the same thing, right? Like, because SDBoot is the one where, like, we like best, but also I think, yeah, systemd should not be tied to that one bootloader. If other people want to do the same thing, it's fine. So we wrote this down. It's extremely simple um, so that other bootloaders, for example, Grub, could do the same thing and then would integrate as nicely with systemd as, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the SDBoot. And there's also support for automatic boot assessment. Automatic boot assessment means, like, uh, in an, if you if there's a system that uh, um, is installed somewhere um, and uh, it should be robust and uh, yeah, you don't necessarily have local access to it, you really care that if you do an upgrade of the OS or update of the kernel and it doesn't boot, it automatically re um, reverts back to the previous version without you doing anything. So they can automatically um, recover. Um, like emulated devices have had that for a long time. We, we didn't have that for in Fedora for the longest time. So SD boot implements automatic boot assessment since quite a while. 
in a relatively simple and robust way. Um, it's documented here how this all works. It's, uh, yeah, the, the, if you do automatic boot assignment, you, what you actually do is like you have a counter. Every time you boot into one boot menu, you increment that counter before you actually boot into it. And then if uh, on the next reboot you realize that this counter is be beyond some threshold, um, then you say, hmm, okay, apparently I booted into this too often, unsuccessfully, and you don't boot into it anymore. This, of course, requires that you somehow have, after the OS has booted up, some code there that figures out, is the system correctly booted up? And if it is, resets the counter again, right? So you basically, yeah, you start from, from zero, it counts up, counts up, counts up, counts up, and even every time it files, it counts up, but every time it succeeds, it just sets it back to zero. So uh, the question is how to store this data. It basically means that the bootloader needs to actually write stuff during boot, right? Like because it has to maintain this counter before it boots into something. We looked into it for a while and figured out we'll do this kind of information file rename because you always have this problem that the only place you can actually persistently um, store data in at every boot, like I mean, you could, you could use EFI variables for this, but EFI variables are not the best choice for this because uh, and VRAMs, like the, the backing store of the EFI variables, is generally not of particularly high quality. And that means it's okay to change it, but it's probably not okay to change it in every boot, right? So keeping a boot counter in the EFI variables, not a good idea. So we don't do this. Other place where we can do persistency is, uh, for example, the ESP itself. So uh, now the question is, um, how do you store the data? The most obvious way that most people would probably think about is storing this information like in a file. But if you do file, then you need to block allocation, these kind of things. So we said, maybe, you know, firmware, file system drivers and firmware are probably not the best quality. So let's avoid all the complexities of block allocation. Let's do something that is highly likely to just require one block update without any block allocation or deallocation or replacement algorithms or anything like this. We figured that file renames are actually the best choice, right? So because that is a single operation that the firmware has to include, uh, to, to define, there's no allocation of any new blocks involved, so it's extremely simple. So how does this work? Um, we have the same drop-ins as we always had before, but now we slightly extend it uh, so that you have a suffix that's called plus three. So the counter that I was uh, talking about is actually reverse of what I had told you because we actually set it to a high value once and then we count down and when we, it hits zero, um, uh, we never boot it again. So on failure, this counter is decremented by one and we also have you counter how often we did this. So then it fails again, decremented again, fail, decrement again. Now we would never boot this again because we give up on this because we tried it three times, all time failed. Anyway, that's a question. Uh, what makes you think that like, trying again with exactly the same setup works the second time? I mean, um, so, the so the question was, what makes me think that uh, trying with the exact same set setup is going to work? Uh, we never know why it failed, right? Like one of the reasons why it might fail is power failure, right? Like somebody pulled the power plugs and you cannot distinguish that between software problem and, and this kind of uh, hardware problem that's not even a hardware problem, right? So uh, um, I think the logic needs to be, we try a couple of times and we system, when we're reasonably sure, yeah. Uh, if you set it to three or to 10 or to one, it's completely up to you, right? Like, if, if, if your own decision is to just try once, then go ahead, um, yeah. That's exactly what we do. So, um, uh, uh, the boot assessment that um, SD boot implements just works by these renames, right? And uh, if you have multiple bootloader entries, like multiple of these drop-ins, we put the ones that have the counter at zero to the very end implicitly, right? So, uh, yeah, so the newest version that has a count above zero gets to the top. So if that one constantly, constantly fails, the counter reaches zero and then ends at the bottom, and then automatically the next newest one is at the top. We boot that one and everything's good. Um, so extremely simple thing. The bootloader is automatic boot assessment is an extension to the bootloader spec. It's implemented by SDBoot. We documented it, so um, actually other bootloaders are, um, are totally okay to implement the same thing if they want. Um, but uh, yeah, that's entirely up to, to them. Um, the bootloader spec is something I first want to push towards making it more accepted across distributions and bootloaders without this stuff, but if they want to go for the stuff as well, that's totally welcome as well. Sorry? So, 
So uh, the question is regarding, can we define different criteria of what the failed boot actually means? Yes, but it is kind of out of the, like, I mean, the bootloader doesn't care anymore about that at all, right? Like, this is something we added to systemd as a general concept, uh, as a general concept where we define a couple of targets, um, like, like multi-user target, but it's called uh, bootcheck.target, I think. So I don't actually know what it's called. Read this specification, explains this all to you. But uh, so the idea basically is that you can plug any program you want um, in front of this target, and uh, um, if that thing fails, then we consider the boot failed as a whole. For example, you could do something like, like a sort of small script that checks if you got a DHCP lease, and then suddenly, when you, the system fails to get a DHCP lease, you say, yeah, it's failed boot, right? And then you automatically revert to the previous one, which maybe got a uh, successful DHCP thing once. Um, Okay, very good question. So what happens uh, uh, if we cycle through all entries and uh, uh, all of them are at zero, right? So that none is interesting anymore. We use the counter for sorting only, right? So if you have a zero counter, you sort it to the end, right? But uh, it's, a, it's a primary key we sort after, the secondary key is the version, right? So if all of them are zero, then it's the newest one of the, all the ones that fails got to reboot next. I mean, it's kind of like, we're in a fucked up situation, we try to make this best thing out of a, a fucked up situation, and then it's probably still the newest one of all the ones that failed if they only failed once. Sorry, come again? Um, why is this uh, better to use than grub? Okay, the question is regarding why is this better to use uh, than grub? Well, I mean, it, comes, it depends on what you actually ex expect from a bootloader. I think this one is way simpler in everything it does because it it's, does not implement a Turing complete language, does not implement a, 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 a scripting language. It just takes this concept that the UFI firmware provides us with anyway because it provides it with so much, like file system access and these kind of things. Um, tries to figure out what we actually need from a bootloader, right? Like, because in Grab, you live in this world where they have a scripting language that is Turing complete, that does uh, pattern expansion, that does, yeah, but it also does all these kind of file system and complex storage and things like that. I genuinely believe this is way too complex for a bootloader. Like, this is stuff we should, should do on the OS, right? And it breaks our backs doing this properly on the OS because it breaks all the time with complex storage. Um, I'm pretty sure this kind of stuff should not be uh, done by the bootloader. So it's uh, mostly, a question of robustness and simplicity, right? This stuff should be stupid. It should be a boot menu, not a boot doing crazy stuff. So, um, yeah? Faster. I don't know. I don't care about faster, but probably it is. I don't know. It's like, I mean, grub, is that slow? Like, I mean, it's definitely it's slow. Um, like, if you rerun the grub stuff, it probably takes a couple of seconds, but who cares about a couple? Like, if you, if, if you install it, I don't know. Yeah, it's probably faster, but it's it's not the not the. I, I I you know I can criticize many things about Grub. I probably wouldn't criticize them for performance. It's yeah. You said the NDFR is the default file system. Is it like uh, bulletproof safe for updating the file system? And if there is a file failure, do you damage the file system and then you are out of booting anything? So. Uh, the question was regarding file system choice, right? Like, because VFAT is not a, a great file system. I, I mentioned it a couple of times in the beginning. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a great file system, but there's no way you can go around it, right? Like, because UFI firmware says VFAT is the thing that you use, right? So you have to upload. We live in a world nowadays we ha where you have to upload bootloaders. There's no, there's no option there, right? Like, bootloaders need to be updated like any software we have. Like, firmware needs to be updated like everything, right? So that VFAT is in the mix is something you just have to accept. I'm sorry. Like, it's not the choice that I made. It's a choice that the firmware developers of UFI made for you. So this stuff just builds on that. And it tries everything that we can do to make this as safe as possible. Is it fully safe? No way, because it's not a transactional file system. But so isn't the choices that we actually make in, in Grub right now. Because, I mean, if you want to have a, a safe file system, you need a journaling kind of thing, right? And they generally don't implement this, and particularly not if you want this stuff writable. And we do want to have this writable, because I believe inherently that the automatic boot assessment where you count stuff, we need a writable file system for the bootloader so that we actually can do the, de the, the counting stuff. So my answer to this is, no, VFAT is not safe. But also, we try our very best on every level to make it safe, right? Like for the automatic boot assessment, we boil it down to a fucking file rename, right? To, to actually do the counting. We don't, we avoid everything that the, uh, that the former can do wrong. And hence, I think it's as safe as it could possibly be, 
but not safer, right? And yeah, again, if you update Grub, it needs to write to the VFAT as well, right? And it's an illusion to believe that Grub never needs to be updated. If I run, like, you know, Grub is this core code base that implements file systems, that implements network protocols, that implements iScanning, I think, or something, right, like this. It, that, uh, HDP has certificate and that kind of thing. It's an illusion to believe that a bootloader never needs to be updated. And UFI makes us to update it in, in VFET, so we have to. So yeah, that's my answer. Um, how much time do we have? Five more minutes. Uh, um, yeah, back to the automatic assessment. Um, yeah, the user space assessment logic that was asked about earlier is all part of system. -y. It's independent of the actual implementation of SD boot. So if you have a different bootloader, like for example, um, uh, Grub, you, you, and you don't want to implement the bootloader spec, then okay, sorry, but sure, it's fine. You can still use the user space assessment logic that figures out if something's okay in a generic way, and yeah. Um, yeah, the bonus of a system called KX, I already mentioned that. It's kind of cool because you now can do a system control. Oh, so actually there's a typo that's supposed to read uh, KX. Um, oh, no, actually not. I uh, had some different intention with this. Sorry. Um, actually, this is a correct line. But uh, um, because the bootloader uh, communicates with the OS about so many things, like, for example, all the bootloader app trees it found, it also works the other way around so that the OS can tell the bootloader what to boot on the next thing, like on the next reboot. And in system control, we have system control reboot dash dash bootloader entry. If your bootloader implements all the stuff that I was talking about, like SD boot does, uh, does, for example, you can use this to boot into a different operating system the next time, um, and the bootloader will basically like, enforce the choice you made on the reboot. Uh, how can you use this? You can, like, for example, this could be exposed in GDM, um, that automatically, when Windows is discovered to be also installed on the system, you get a reboot into Windows option somewhere, and then when you click on it, um, it just uses it, stores an EFI variable, the request that the next reboot should actually be into Windows, then uh, you reboot, the bootloader sees that EFI variable, says, uh, oh, I'm supposed to boot into Windows. Let's see if I have Windows installed. I do, yes, then this is the uh, bootloader entry that I'm gonna boot into. I'm also gonna delete this EFI variable right now so that it only applies for this one, and everything's good. So. Uh, this is implemented in SD boot. Again, every bootloader can implement this, actually, as long as they implement the bootloader spec and the bootloader interface and these kind of things. So yeah, again, it's all going to be so much better if people implement the bootloader spec and uh, bootloader interface. One easy way to do this is actually use the SD boot bootloader. Um, there's also, similar to the system control reboot to bootloader entry, you can just boot into the bootloader menu, and it just tells the bootloader menu to just turn off the timeout. Right, so that the bootloader menu is shown and uh, you're not time out to automatically boot something. I already mentioned that system, the analyze uses this stuff, and yeah. As you boot inspection on Fedora, you mostly can do SD boot, and, uh, boot control install and just works. Most other distributions use it as well, like have it as well. Arc Linux uses it by default. Um, this is my last slide. Let's unify on the bootloader spec, support the bootloader interface, support automatic boot assessment, use SD boot would be the best thing. It gives you all of the buff for free. And that's all I have, and I don't think I have much time, but I, maybe a couple of minutes, I don't know. I still have five minutes, so more questions, please. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, I didn't get it. My question, like, so the question was regarding, so why is it not the default in Fedora? Um, uh, yeah, good question. Like, I mean, it's kind of the, the thing is like, I'm not a fan of Grub, as you can guess. Um, and I, I think Grub's fine. Like, we probably always have to have it as long as we have uh, architectures to support that don't use UFI, which we do, because that's AWS for you, that forces that on us. Um, but the way I think this all should look like is that we can all standardize on the bootloader spec maybe a couple of the other things I just presented, then in an ideal world, we then would use SD boot on, on x86 UFI and use something else on something else, but they all would just agree on the bootloader spec, and implementing the bootloader spec properly in, in, in Grub isn't that hard. But uh, yeah, it's a political thing. Let's say the, the, that Grub has the mind share instead of Red Hat that I kind of want to try to break a little bit with this talk. I hope that's the answer. Another question. 
So uh, the, I, I think I understood the question correctly, and you're asking how to easy use this in distributions like Fedora. Uh, you, it's packaged for Fedora, as mentioned. You can just install the package, it comes to systemd boot RPM, and then you can just type boot control install, and it mostly works. I hope I'm not promising too much, because um, as mentioned, there are two implementations of the bootloader spec, the BLS one and the real one. And uh, if you end up with these snippets that the, the current grub stuff does, then it it's a script that was written there that does require variable expansion. Ashley boot doesn't read that. System control reboot doesn't read that. Nobody does, but uh, so not sure if I'm promising too much. But I think um, what is sufficient if you install system reboot and remove all the grub stuff, and then now uh, probably just works. Yeah. So the question was regarding um, whether SD boot works without the UFI. No, the answer is absolutely clearly a no. It's not I'm never going to do this. But the bootloader spec um, doesn't require you any of this. So my hope was that let's just all agree on the bootloader spec. Super simple. Everybody can implement this. We already do. On UFI, then you have the option to use SD boot and everything else, use something else. But uh, yeah, SD boot is not going to deliver you booting from MBR. I'm sorry. But I think in general, one of the core ideas that we should follow is actually that whenever we do, do think about booting, we always focus on what the gold standard of booting is these days. And the gold standard of booting is, like it or not, I don't care, it's UFI, it's not MBR, right? Like, so it should never be a race to the bottom where we make everything work like the old stuff from 1981 or something, but let's do it the other way around where UFI is kind of what we want to go for, what we want to support, and then if we have systems that are not UFI, then let's try our best to make them enough like UFI. Let's add a little bit of components that make it feel like UFI, that add the basic concepts that we need so that, yeah, we are not a race to the bottom, but a race to the top. We agree on the, on the best uh, functionality and not on the least functionality. Uh, So the question was regarding um, whether uh, 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 if you have installed Windows and this stuff at the same time, and then Windows is updated and override the bootloader, if it's mitigated in any way? No, unfortunately not. So I mean, it's 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 yeah. I mean, the the, the primary bootloader that gets invoked by the firmware, it needs to support us for these options to show up, right? Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so at least. I mean, if you have uh, 25 Linux distributions and they would all implement this, they wouldn't uh, uh, fuck it up anymore. But yeah, I mean, we don't control Windows. And unfortunately, Windows doesn't implement something like this. They have no interest in making our options show up in their boot menu. If they had, that would be great. Maybe the new Microsoft is actually open to uh, uh, be friendly to this guy. That would be awesome, of course, but I think it's illusionary. But yeah, any other questions? But I think my time's, there's one more. Who signs that? Yeah. It's up to you. I don't care. Like it's a, it's like a, I mean, Fedora has an infrastructure uh, uh, for signing. If Fedora signs it. You can't modify, do any changes inside of. Fedora. Yeah, it's kind of the idea. And if you, um, yeah, I mean, Secuboot. Secuboot is about uh, uh, making sure that code runs in exactly that version that the vendor of the code wanted it to run in, right? So if, when, if Fedora builds a unified kernel that uh, uh, locks all these things down, it would be ridiculous if we would break it up and not uh, 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 actually make sure that, yeah, everything's probably measured. The idea of Secuboot is to lock this down, so Secuboot should lock it down, and that's the answer to this, right? Um, I think my time's over. Thank you very much all for the good questions. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs>